We have a question from Don that comes along with a $20 donation. Thank you so much, Don. We appreciate it. Uh, hail Alzheimer Yagothi and Witten Svon. Fantastic insight. I also hail Thor. Every time I hear thunder, it just comes out of me. Svon, would you let us in on some of the secrets you've hidden in Thor's mural? Uh, yeah. Uh then they wouldn't be secrets. No, no. <laughs> there's a lot of little, uh, there's a lot of little Easter eggs in there. And in reality, um, they came about kind of as the evolution of, of the mural. I mean, are we going to go into the, I was going to, you want to go into the murals? Cause I mean, I know there's questions coming in and this is um, kind of, a, uh, so, so, okay, so, so separ separate here because we also have another question coming up in the line about your experiences painting the mural. So separate your content questions from your experience of painting it questions, if you would. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, the inception of the mural really did come about through, uh, it was a reaction. There were things going on and it led to specifics of the mural uh, and, and the way it was going to be presented. One of the first things was um, uh, coming to to the Hoff to be. Uh, I like to joke and say the the Emir body. It was it wasn't quite shaped to what we were going to to bring, but it was there. And we walked in and we saw this alcove, and immediately just struck me as, you know, that's where he needs to be that's where he wants to to stand over his house and at the time to be to be completely honest i didn't know where we were going to go with this i didn't know what what um type of godsteads we were going to be working with i didn't know if we were going to do statuary i didn't know if we were going to do a painting if we were going to do other sort of imagery and things like that uh god poles and or, there was all sorts of stuff on the on the list but when i walked in there and i saw that archway i, I just really knew if this is the way it's going to evolve, he needs to be there because that is where he wants to be. And I, I, I say that very lightly. I'm not, not saying – I just had an overwhelming feeling of that <laughs> moment where I was just like this is – everything just fills into this spot. And I could see an image there in my mind of what I, what I would – want is just the correlation of other things that needed to be to evolve from it so um naturally i wanted to show a combination of things uh really i wanted to show a upper lower i wanted to show force will power uh and dynamicism uh attacking kind of an otherworldly alienism and then i wanted to also bring in um the elements of 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 cowardice in which when the when the string is being cut from Jormungandr this moment uh it could be read as like if people read the story and th thought of this as like a moment of failure really the failure uh, and onus falls on cowardice and so the the uh, the events that were going on around that time were really pervading about action and about standing up for your beliefs and about attainment. This was the first Hoff outside of Odin's Hoff that was going to breach the threshold. It was on the other so, side. Let me, let me interrupt for just a sec. Cause I think this is background. That's going to be useful to the rest of the story. And I'm going to throw up the other question as well. And we can combine these two with just telling the whole tale of the mural. So the next question is from filthy heathen. Svan, could you talk a bit about your experience painting the Thorshof mural? So about all of these things and to set them to the backdrop. Um, so many of these things are so big that it's hard when we get a really specific question to winnow it down to what's what's relating to it and what's not because everything links to everything else so excuse me if i take a pause on that sometimes so i was talking to in some kind of a context it was talking to uh, sheila mcnallen uh, a little while back and she mentioned that uh, 
you know, her and Steve weren't weren't exactly sure where this all would go and how this would all develop. Um, it was such a long struggle to get our first Hoff that, um, you know, nobody really knew what that was going to be like. If that's the only Hoff we're going to have and everything's just going to be about that or, you know, nobody knew for sure there was going to be other Hoffs or that that's the way we were going to go or what we were going to do. Um, when I when I became Alice Harrier Gothi, it was very important to me to build temples to to each of these these gods of ours. And uh, that was a really important thing for me. Um, Odin's Hof, it was originally called uh, New Grange Hall, and it was kind of a, a generic Hof to, to the ICR and a, a assembly hall for, for the AFA. And at that time, again, we didn't know that we were going to have all these other Hofs. When we had to change the name of, of the Hof, and I dedicated that Hof, and this was, we, we had to do the name change of the Hof after I uh, became Alz Harrier Gothi. And at that point, it was very important with that opportunity to me to dedicate that Hof specifically to Odin and to make that the first of many Hofs. This was a, um, when we talk about titling our Hofs, Thor's Hof is Thor's Hof, the second Hof of the Ausser True Folk Assembly, because we knew that we were going to continue this process. Even before that, when we made the sign for Odin's Hof, it was Odin's Hof, the first Hof of the Ausser True Folk Assembly, putting it out there that we plan to have many more Hofs. And the actually the idea of putting that title at the bottom, the subtitle, the first Hof of the Ausser True Folk Assembly, was our law speaker Alan Turnage's idea. Um, but yeah, when we got, so before this, uh, we would always have an event and this event has become the Thor's Hof event, but we would have Ostara in the South was a, was a national event a number of years previous to this. And we'd go to this and every time the people, um, people in first anyone who was at the event, but very specifically folks who were in our, in the Carolinas, would ask, you know, how do we how do we get a Hoff over on the East Coast? How do we get a Hoff near us? And we talked about that. And man, they they're like, man, we really one day what what can we do? We'll do anything to get a Hoff near us. This is the most important thing. How do we get a Hoff? And they were so excited about it. And uh, eventually, you know, when we were when we were making this decision and we found the location of you know well okay when we were scouting the location for Thor's Hoff. And uh, we decided on looking in the South, um, we looked at our membership base and where we had leadership. And we had a very, um, very active membership at that time in the Carolinas and a couple of kindreds who were, were very active. And man, they, they wanted this Hoff so bad. And they talked such a big game about how much we need to do this. We need to make this happen. And I think everybody is very comfortable with dreams as long as those dreams are out of reach it's fun to talk about them when there's when there's no consequence and there's literally no skin in the game it's a it's a fun idea so they put this out there and they asked me to get them off and okay cool so uh the leader of one of these kindreds and a, a folk builder at the time and somebody who was in our uh gothar program at the time you know, this, this Hoff was going to be in, in his state and close to him and whatever. And I asked, you know, before we even got it, like, Hey, I want to make sure that you guys have this and this is something you're going to do and you're going to be able to take care of and you're comfortable with this. Reality is different than theory. So are you good? Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm good. hundred percent. I'm behind it. hundred percent. I'll, this will be great. Okay. And then again, are you sure? Nope, I'm sure 100% go forward, we'll do it. So we got in contract, got the money down, got ready to get it. And once reality hit, once reality hit like that lightning bolt of four, um, all of a sudden fear overtook people in uh, the area. And this gentleman in within, I think a succession of three or four days, quit the Gothar program, quit being a folk builder, 
and quit the AFA in general, along with his whole kindred, because they were terrified of the attention that Thor's Hoff would bring to them. And, and he told me like, you know, hey, I don't know about this. This is, this is right down the road from, from where I work and where I live. And I, what are we going to do? And uh, this was after he gave his word on several occasions. But reality is much harder when there's consequence, when there's weight. So we basically had to rebuild um, the entire state of North Carolina and much of the state of South Carolina. Most of Thor's Hoff was saved and taken care of and nursed there for the, that uh, beginning period by people from, um, people from Virginia, which is quite a ways away if you're driving. And there. South Carolina. Big stuff happened. Yeah. Some of our South Carolina folks, but uh, North Carolina, and it's come back quite a bit. We're more successful there now than we ever have been. But this initial group, they let fear overtake them. And the Thor's fishing trip where he tries to, to pull in the, the world serpent, it's all fun and games until all of a sudden that serpent bites. And then the giant that was with him was overtaken by fear and you know, Thor has victory in his grasp. He's got Jormungandr on the line and pulling him in. And the terror of the reality of that was too much. And that giant cut the line and couldn't handle it. Um, and I think this piggybacks really well on our uh, discussion we had last week about courage. Um, talking about a theoretical that's distant in the future that you're not facing is very, very easy. But staring Jormungandr in the face on the other end of this hook, reality is, is terrifying. And that's when you see who's, who has that courage within themselves and who just talks a big game. And it's a, it's a, it's a tragic thing and it's a beautiful thing, depending on which way it cuts. And it often cuts both ways. And, it cuts differently on, on people that you would expect much out of, let you down on it, and people who you expect little out of blow you away with their character. So uh, those thoughts were a lot of the things permeating um, the ether at that time. Another thing to consider is, and Svan was, was bringing this up a little bit, and I'm not trying to take the, the air out of your story, Svan. I apologize. No, this is great. I just think this is good background. Um, this was setting the tone. Odin's Hof was our first Hof, but as far as a mural and really making the Hof focused on the worship of a god, this was that big first step. And it was scary because I tell you what, I didn't know what kind of art Svan could do. I saw some sketches, but I didn't know. So we're, we're going to let this guy throw some paint on it and see what happens. Um, Get the primer ready. <laughs> I was okay. So we didn't know how to do. And secondly, I was obnoxious and like bugging him. He kept sending me pictures of every stage of the process. I'm really fortunate in that every time we do a mural, I harass Svan and he sends me all these different stages of watching it develop. And I, that's one of the most special things as a, as an ulterior Gothic perk, I suppose. It's really neat watching those come, come together, but Svan outdid himself on it and I'll, I'll leave it with this and then it's then it's Svan's turn I promise um, I so I went out there for the dedication and again I saw this mural develop I saw pictures of it before anybody else did when you walk into that vey There's not good enough words to describe the power of that first sight of Thor and how it hits you. And it hits you different than any of these other murals. And it it literally blows you away. Um, but I had that experience. It was also very special at the uh, first Ostara that was hosted there, which is their, their national showcase event. Um, Steve and Sheila McNallan were there. And Steve was blown away by it as well. I, I was with them when they walked in for the first time. And uh, 
you know, Svan said there's all kind of different ideas about what we could have done or where it would have gone. It's hard now after the fact to imagine it going any other way because it was so perfect and so powerful. And so uh, with that, you can go back to your story. I apologize for- No, no. So there. again, the, the folk watching this don't know that like we don't prep for this. So, you know, how, what level we're going to take it, but you just brought it in to very real point. And I, you know, I'm, I can kind of glance around these things, but you just kind of dropped it right into the ring. What you were talking about is about, about how you, this has become a very intimate subject with a lot of history behind it. And you brought it into focus there. When I walked into Thorshoff, with the intention of doing the murals because it had, it, this was where we were going to go with it. All of what that was here ago, they just said was in play. Um, I, I, there was only two people that were kind of on the ground doing work initially for the Hoff. Uh, all of, all of the groundwork, all of the real estate, everything that was going on uh, initially started out with two people and it was me and the uh, leader of that kindred. And uh, so words were spoken to me as well uh, in front of the Hoff, actually, that we were going to do this. It was time. We had talked about this for many, many, many years before the Hoff was even a reality. Uh, we were talking about, man, it would just be great if we had a Hoff <laughs> in, on the East Coast. Oh, it would be great if it was in Virginia or North Carolina, right in our backyard so that we could really get this done. When it became a reality... Uh, you know, when it's time to do real stuff, sometimes you find out who, who's really there and who isn't. And, um, you know, he left. Everybody's uh, a gangster until it's time to do gangster stuff. Right. Well, and it, it, it came on a Sunday night, uh, I think, because I didn't find out till Tuesday, uh, which perhaps has some importance there too, but I didn't find out till a, uh, till a Tuesday that, that he had left. And um, so suddenly I was held... By, I was by myself holding the bag, if you will. And um, that was a real strong moment. And instead of, oh, well, he's out, you know, I can't do this by myself. There's just no way that this is going to happen. Um, and then at the same time, we're having these conversations and you're asking me, well, why should we even do it there now? Because we have this kind of deficit. And I, I was like, please, I think that the that the Virginia folk and the South Carolina folk, I, I, there's people around, we can float this. And I remember you saying, this is a huge risk. Like there's nothing there. You're coming from a, a distance away. Uh, you, you, are you willing to drive that to do that? Are you willing to put time in to do that? And I was pleading, yes, yes, we can't. If this is the case, if this is what we've got. And again, there's a fortuitous story about the nature of us attaining the building in and of itself and prayers to Thor. I felt at this point, if Thor had sanctioned this to happen, it, it, was, it was incumbent upon me to do anything I could to convince you and to convince everybody that this was worth the, the challenge. And so I did not step out. I did not back away. I went headlong in and you had faith in me to to do that i remember you saying like this okay we're gonna do this but you gotta you know you gotta make this happen and it it was a a, a whirlwind of action and movement to get the building and do everything that we were doing and then of course there were people that were kind of coming around and, and all of that stuff but that really was lost in the din of what we were what we were going to start doing and one of the first things that we started doing was the mural and the mural became the point of Godstead, this was, we wanted, it was such a focal point that we wanted to do it. And because of all of this stuff that me and the Alice here, they had been talking about when I went in there, you know, uh, Rimskvida, Rimskvida is the story of Thor's fishing trip. And I wanted to do the point where it really kind of emphasized was when Thor starts to row out further, and the fear in that story starts to build and it culminates with the cutting of the rope that became the story that we needed to put up there. I was originally just thinking of doing just an image, a godstead of Thor, but 
we added the element with Jormungandr and Hrim because of the, the notion of courage and fear. And it was almost as if it was all happening with purpose and <clears throat> that the gods were, that Thor was involved in that. I, I, I believe that in a, in a way that I can't explain without sounding kind of kooky, but I really felt like we were in a mythos of our, of our development as a church, because there were so many factors going on. So that the choice of uh, him Spida's the fishing trip uh, where he cuts the line became the focal point. And then from there, the idea was how to position it, how to do it and what color schemes, what were we going to do? Um, you know, the art of the AFA is not art of, uh, you know, like it doesn't look like a black metal album. <laughs> That that was not something that, and I think the Alcira Gothi and I were talking about that. Like we want colors, brightness, life, happiness. We want to see the boldness of colors that our ancestors wore when they went to the Elfing, or 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 you know when you go to Nordic uh, towns now and you see the the houses are brightly colored and and all of that stuff that that um, that spirit that can't be broken not even by the land. It's just happy and filled with life and and so we started to form we had the story that we wanted to do and we had kind of an idea of the dimensions of what we were going to do and then we started talking about coloring and things like that and then there was this moment where the al go the kind of was like all right get get to getting it and uh i i had never painted a mural before so like i've uh, i've only done mediums of very small pictures so the first thing we started doing I just had the notion or the idea of putting up painter's tape and basically doing the whole um, uh, image on, with painter's tape and pencil to get an idea of scope, to make sure that things didn't look too uh, odd or out of place. And when I was sending these tape pictures, I, I, it's like, it just looks like scraps of tape all over the place. And, uh, sketches and, and little scratches all over the wall. Um, and, you know, I, I knew the scope of it wasn't going to be caught, but as your ago, he was working with me. He, he was telling me what he wanted. He wanted to see some of the elements of this. He wanted to see the size. He wanted to have gravitas and power. And that's where the development of the sonnen rod over the head really started to, to formulate. And so through this back and forth via calls and texts, and I think, you know, because I can't be on the phone while I'm doing it. There's these moments where I think, like, uh, how about this? And I'd show a picture, and he, no, the eyes are, they got to look like this. And I'm like, okay, I'll try it. So, I, you know, I go in and I do it. How about this? No. Nah. And then we, we would angle it. And, I mean, thankfully, <laughs> you, you didn't really, you, it was very constructive criticism. It was never about just tweaking it uh, out of, I think, strictly just a desire of something you wanted you had constructive points of where you wanted the eyes to look uh, the, the emanation of light the positioning of the body there was real good constructive criticisms that kind of built out and once we got that foundation going then it just took off you know and guys as a side point um Svan and I are able to do this on, on a lot of different things. And I think we, we complement each other very well in certain ways. Um, I've got, I can see things in my head. I have a lot of thoughts about art, but I can't make art. Like I can, I know what I want, but I can't make that manifest. And Svan has an amazing ability to be able to manifest these things into the into the physical and make them beautiful. And it was really cool to be able to be some part of that process. And I never want to overburden it, and not let the artist put it all out there because the gods are working through Svan in a very special way. Um, but yeah, it's it's we were big on on working with the metallics in the picture. The metallics yeah. were one of those big things he and I spoke about. And then that uh, that that black sun halo uh, that now adorns all of our all of our gods and uh, will when we do arts of our heroes as well. Uh, but red for the heroes and, and gold for for the the Aesir. Um, 
was really special to be part of that while this was developing. And uh, I remember, I remember that all so clearly. It really takes me back. I appreciate you telling the story about this one. Yeah, the that that time, and I and again, Alter Goldi was not hitting uh, uh, like backseat driver level stuff. He was he was basically giving honest criticisms about the way it would be more dynamic to do something, or perhaps it would be better if we did it this way. And I would try it. And then we'd sit back, we'd take a picture of it, we'd look at things, and then, yep, no, that's it. That's hitting it right there. And then so it started to develop. And once we got the groundwork going, there was this time where I, I really couldn't be on the phone. And it, it was it was I was doing the mural over a series of weekends because I was working, and then I would come down around Thursday and I would stay till Saturday night. And so when it really got pitched it was kind of like our communication was at the beginning and then a little bit at the end and then we would kind of adjust I would you know like take down kind of mental notes of what you were saying and then when I came back the next week I would hit those notes and then send a picture and say how about now what is what are you thinking about this and so there was an intimate kind of conversation between us because we were hitting the first threshold of of imagery of the AFA and to me I was challenged with the task of it, but it was you that were, you were talking about an age of art. You were looking at something bigger than even I could understand. Was that you like, you were kind of like, like Svan, think about this. Like there's gonna be a time when people are gonna look back at this time and your hands are going to be involved in an age of like depiction of the gods and <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so it kind of like, Oh, but it, it helped, it helped me, it helped hone me. And it really did help me keep clarification during that time because of everything that was going on on the outside. Like I said, people were, were dropping out in the middle of the, the weekend in the middle of the night and just kind of slinking back out of this. I'm not touching this. And, you know, I've got my family to worry about. And I, I have a family, I have a job, I, I have a lot to lose. And I, I, I kept going forward. And the only thing I really super focused on was the threshold of creating the mural. Um, so th there's like a lot of different things in the mural that I would say to get back to the question about Easter eggs or, or about hidden meanings, really the colors are kind of symbolic. Uh, they have intention and meaning also to um, because we're pulling from a Nordic myth uh, I, I we were talking about like the appearance of thor and and correlation to um uh tangible historical context but more so than just m the material so like there's little things like uh e even though the wool wraps around his legs have tiny little um like golden aglets or golden hooks that that were that were used on actual wool wraps of the legs during uh, amongst the Anglo-Saxons and the Nordic period. So we, we, I was trying to pay attention to some of the detail there. Uh, the other thing I really wanted to, um, every, every mural has a seed that correlates to another Hoff because like the Alzheimer ago, they said, this was the beginning. This was the second Hoff. There was going to be more. So one of the things I really wanted to place in was breathable. I wanted to place in the iron rod in his belt because Grida is the mother of Vidar or Vidar. And so that little nod there, even though it's kind of hard to connect the dots, I wanted it to be there on purpose because it was, a, you know, we're coming down the line. We're going to open a temple to Vidar. And I wanted that correlation to be there. And so every Hoff kind of has a little nod or a lean to one or the other. Um, oh, you know, a lot of people don't realize that, like, I, I got a chance to go to to Odenshof after Baldershof. So in Baldur's, there's a nod to Odenshof because I was going there next. And so everyone kind of correlates to one ahead of it um, or a one to proceed. So Gridevol, uh the runes on Grievevol, the runes on his belt. Um, this was before the folk food arc. Now, I I wanted to bring this up because I I've, I've heard rumors, little birds telling me things that 
people are under the misconception that we somehow like created a new Futhark. Um, no, that is, I, I'm insulted that they would think we would be that hubris. <laughs> like, no, the idea, uh, it, I think it comes from their ignorance and the fact that they haven't developed art yet. And a lot of these, the criticisms that are coming at us are coming from people that don't have established art or have the, the medium in which they're going to have large scale artwork being presented to the folk in representation of the gods and what kind of respect level that has. They don't have that, so they start shooting in the dark and saying, oh, they're making up this crap, and they're making up these runes. No. In actuality, the folk Futh arc was not even in process during Thor's mural, but what happened was is I was starting to write things down to give context. I wanted Grievel to be on his belt, but if there was an iron rod with nothing on it, then the people wouldn't understand what that was unless they looked into the story, but I could give it right then and there, and then they would be like, oh, and then they go back and look it up. But I wanted to do it in runic. So if we're going to do it in runic, how do we do it in runic? And what Alzheimer Gothi and I sat down and we talked about it and we thought, okay, how about we use all the Futharks that have already been in existence? Every, like all of them. And, 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 and pull some from each one to create a, Footh arc that we will use for artistic expression. The idea is that we want to we want to pass on lore, but some people are familiar with the elder, some people are familiar with the younger, some people are familiar with the Anglo-Saxon Frisian, others are you know with the Armanan. Suddenly we realize like, there's people that have different you know understandings of the runes. So let's pull a little bit from each one. That'll encourage them to study cross and see see the symbols in different ways and also allow us to convey a message in our artwork so that folk years from now can read it and understand it without having some sort of confusion based on rules from other futharks. So we basically just created a linguistical medium in order to better describe what's going on in the artwork. We weren't trying to create a new magical system. We weren't trying to create some sort of a, uh, you know, AFA super rune Futhark that we're going to use. Uh, it, it was it, like when I found out about this criticism and it kind of like hurt my head at, at what level that would be levied at us or levied at me. Um, no, it was about art. It's about expressing the spiritual. It's about things that were going on at the time being expressed through the painting in order to encourage the folk to learn a lesson from it. And one of the big things is about fear along the edge of the boat. Um, you know, it's, it's clearly stating there that Himmer is, is struck with fear while Thor is the Lord of action. He's moving forward. He's about to crush. He's going to take all of the power of earth and heaven and place it right that in the middle of that, which constrains the middle earth. And it gets cut because him is a, a coward. That was what I was trying to convey. And I couldn't just do it with just pictures. I wanted to add words and things. So the folk, folk food art was actually developed at the end of that. So there's pieces of it that aren't in the folk food art. And I'm deliberating right now whether or not to go back and adjust. I have adjusted some things, but I don't want to do it. I'm approaching the Godstead with a sense of reverence. I don't want to just... Oh, you know, we're going to erase this and, and do this. It's more or less like, okay, I'm, I'm going to refocus on how I got to plan this out because runes have sizes and I don't want to overshoot or undershoot and create gaps and kind of mess with the, with the completion of it. So we still have to edit some stuff with the, with the folk food arc, but after Thor's off, the folk, the folk food arc was in place and it was, it was all about being able to convey messages through art. So I wanted to bury that kind of rumor or, I don't know, wind that seems to catch people's tongues. Um, we, uh, you know, uh, utilizing that, the other thing that I have never done a mural before Thor's Hoff. So I, a funny little thing is um, my, uh, my usage of, uh, I, I have done, um, I used to do tattoos and I have done tattoo work and usually you're, you're dealing with a single piece 
strong borders, not a lot of space. Background was a big thing for me and natural background and utilizing clouds and mountains and waves. I had no experience in whatsoever. So I did a lot of studying a lot. I, I, I you know, I went, looked in art books. I looked at, because I live on the be- at the beach and I, I looked at waves and in paintings. I've even I even went to <laughs> I went to Bob Ross at one point because I couldn't quite make the waves look 3D or, or like they were actually curling forward. And I remember typing in uh, waves on stormy ocean, Bob Ross, and like looking at his technique and then trying it. And I was fully assuming there's no way I'm going to be able to replicate this. This is Bob Ross we're talking about here. And I felt like I got, I got in a good spot. So that's some of the stuff, the coloring, the choice of the story, the usage of the folk food arc or runes in general to create uh, a, an extension of, um, or, uh, or uh, to expound on the meaning of things. And then also to the establishment of the sun and rod around the head, the uh, establishment of Mjolnir and the runes upon his belt. So, you know, and, and, and making sure that we have, uh, you know, iron glove and iron grip in there and things. Cause those were also gifts given to Thor from Grida to hold breathable or excuse me. No, it's uh, the gifts from the, uh, the dwarves to hold Mjolnir. And so I wanted to add this kind of idea of evolution of the toolage of Thor, because we see amongst no other God. And this kind of correlates back to that question about um, why a symbol of Thor, the hammer, is because we see this evolution in Thor with imagery towards him that directly correlate to the time in which we are in. We see our ancestors and we see the Pan-Aryanism of the club. And then the club kind of evolves into the axe or the bronze axe or the hammer axe. And then we see by the, by the time of the, the late Nordic period, which, you know, the, 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 the last vestige of our faith, the, the, the evolution of Mjolnir became a hammer. And, um, so, you know, understanding that the, the gods evolve with us. So that was another big point I wanted to show with, with Grievable being in the belt, and there's some symbology there, uh, but I mean, I think we could talk about that in a, a little bit later as far as some of the intention there. But I, I just wanted to say that was some of the things that we were trying to really get out there. And it was under, when I went in there, there was a ton of stuff going on around us that inspired a lot of this. That was very long winded, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I, in, uh, inside baseball, these are organic, but that's the one thing I sent Svan earlier today, like be prepared to talk about the mural because I knew that was going to be a big deal because it's such a special, beautiful tribute that we've done and that uh, Svan has done for Asa Thor. It's, uh, it really is worthy of myth and legend and it's spectacular and it's, it's uh, a really important thing to talk about. Um, so I had something I was going to say, but it slipped my mind. Hopefully I will think of it later and be able to say something then. Um, we have a uh, $10 donation from Tyler Bethay. Uh, thank you so much, Tyler. We appreciate you. He says, great to see you two gentlemen tonight. Hail the AFA. We appreciate Hail Tyler Bethay. There we go. And uh, hail Bob Ross. We appreciate that. Bob Ross... <laughs> I think he's underrated as an artist, but the stuff he's able to do on a canvas is really magical. And I'm, I'm glad that was able to help you with the waves. I either didn't know that or didn't recall that. Yeah. I, I never even told you that. And that's another point that I wanted to bring up to the folk is that we don't pre-script this. This is you're, sometimes I think you're learning stuff that I haven't really talked about as we're doing these podcasts. No, I'm a, I, I'm, I'm a Bob Ross fan, not so much a fan too. of his hair, but a fan of his art, absolutely. 